Hello, today is uh, the 25th of October and we are talking about a post-mortem of the last presidential debate between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. And uh, we're kind of a week behind time, but the discussion will be between Dave DeWitt, journalist for Athens News, and Robert Whaley, retired professor from Ohio University. And this is called Athens Speak Out, number 386. And the moderator is Steve Antler. And he will ask us, uh, ask both of us a series of questions. Question one to Dave DeWitt, and question two to Robert H. Whaley. And we'll see how far he gets, four or five, before the half time comes. And then we'll continue three or four more. And then conclusion, two minute summary for Dave, and a two minute summary for Robert H. Whaley. And we'll see how far we get. So um, you can start out. Uh, with the first question. Okay, David, uh, this has been the third debate. Uh, it was uh, Chris Wallace was the moderator, and it was on Fox News, uh, and it's between uh, candidates uh, Hillary Clinton and uh, Donald Trump. I guess it was last Thursday evening. Las Vegas. In Las Vegas, Nevada. The 19th, 19th of, uh, of October. Okay. And uh, so basically, I'm just going to ask, what was your assessment of, of that? Uh, let's just go with the first part of the debate. We'll break it down into pieces. Well, I think that uh, essentially Hillary Clinton came off as studied and prepared and um, ready to debate. I think that Donald Trump continued his performance as unprepared, unstudied, easily mockable and uh, fundamentally an unserious candidate for presidency of the United States. Okay, do you recall some of those first questions that was asked by Chris Wallace? Um, as I recall that the debate started off with uh, questions about the Supreme Court. Maybe that wasn't the first question, but yeah, that's, I think that that's was. the first yeah, thing that, that I remember. Question. Supreme Court. Yeah, they were talking about the Supreme Court initially. and. Um, Donald Trump basically promised to appoint Supreme Court justices in the mold of Antonin Scalia, and that should be terrifying to any American who cares about separation of church and state or uh, freedom from the yoke of corporations or fairness in our elections that aren't uh, controlled by unlimited amounts of dark money or really any issue that uh, doesn't align with an extreme hard right view of the world. So, okay. how about you, Professor? Yeah, okay. Robert, I'll well, give you the same question. Well, uh, I would like to begin with uh, uh, Mike Wallace's... Uh, Chris Wallace. Chris Wallace. No, it says Chris? Chris. Yeah, Chris. yeah, Mike is his father. Yes. I'm sorry about that. Anyway, um, Last week, previous week, Colts to Larry, Larry Sabado on the 12th of October um, gave a, uh, a claim that Hillary was way ahead in the polls in the Electoral College. And there were 10 swing states uh, which could go either way. And she only needed one more state to get the necessary 200. 70 electoral votes. So it was already predictable before the Wallace even opened his mouth that uh, uh, Hillary was going to win, according to Sabado and most of the pundits. I might mention that Larry Sabado is a uh, professor at the University That's of Virginia. Good. Okay. So uh, at, at Trump then, according to this poll, uh, only had one small chance of getting the necessary 270 in the nine swing states. Ohio was too close to call, and as far as I can see, it's still too close to call. Pennsylvania was definitely going to go for Clinton, according to Sabado. Seems like Pennsylvania has tightened up a bit. Anyway, uh, Sabado's prediction was for the Senate race, he would make no predictions 
until the 7th of November because uh, the Senate races are too, the polls are too unstable. Uh, he didn't want to be stuck with the famous Truman uh, Gallup poll in which he predicted too soon. But anyway, Sabato's predictions were, not, no predictions yet, but anyway, there are now 47 Democrats in the Senate and 47 Republicans, and there are six swing states, Pennsylvania and New Hampshire, we're leaning toward uh, the Democrats. Four states are too close to call, Missouri, Indiana, North Carolina, and Nevada. And the most amazing state was Utah. Too close to call, and here's where the religious issue comes to bear. Because Trump's attack on Christianity and Jewish values have alienated this very religious state, which is Mormon predominant religion. And the second closest religion in Utah is Roman Catholic. So the previous Mormon Republican candidate, Mitt Romney, now endorses Hillary. And the governor of the state is voting independent, so that right now the state of Utah is divided. 26% for the Democrats, 26% for the Republicans, 22% for the independents, the situation this week seems to be the same. So uh, Utah is too, too close to call, and this would be the first time that Utah will vote for a Democrat since Franklin Roosevelt. Anyway, uh, on the 18th of October, the pulses were predicting that Trump was losing ground nationally eight points, according to my latest uh, figure. You got a different figure? Is Nationally, yeah. uh, they seem to fluctuate between about eight and twelve points, depending. Yeah, I'm gonna, Robert. I'm gonna have uh, David uh, comment on what you just commented on, as far as the religious uh, people and and uh, Trump alienating uh, those uh, people in in Utah and all that. Uh, did you want to elaborate on that, uh, David? Well, I don't think it's very surprising. I, Donald Trump doesn't come off as a particularly pious man and uh, despite his promises with regard to the Supreme Court for instance uh, appointing justices in the mold of Antonin Scalia um, his own actions repeated actions throughout the campaign cycle and throughout his life uh, don't put him on any sort of a, a higher ground to stand on with regard to moral or ethical issues important to particularly religious people um, so I'm not surprised that religious people have a hard time relating to him. There's not much there to relate to. He claims to be Presbyterian. He, the church that he claims to attend doesn't uh, denies that he's any sort of a regular um, practicing churchgoer. Um, I think most of his allusions to being a man of faith are fairly transparently um, disingenuous. And... I do think that it's interesting and fascinating that Utah, specifically the Mormons, probably because of the influence of Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney's been a fairly vocal critic of Trump throughout the campaign, and he wields a lot of influence within the Mormon community, and that's probably why they're following his lead in rejecting the politics of Donald Trump. I think it'll be very interesting if this third party candidate actually wins a state in this election. We haven't yeah. seen that. Yeah. in a very long time. That's true. Well, I think that uh, Dave uh, understates yeah. this problem. Okay. Robert, I want you to go back to that first question that you thought was Supreme Court question. Well, before I get to the Supreme Court, I just want to make one comment okay. about Dave's philosophy. All right. I think he greatly underestimates the sexual question. Trump has alienated 90% of the women in the United States sexual assault, groping, pornographic stuff. He's going to get very few women, either black, white, or young and old. That's all I want to do yeah. to that. Okay, let's talk about the Supreme Court question. Okay, Supreme Court question. Uh, Hillary's answer, no, the global question was, if you're elected, what would you do is to both candidates? If you're elected, what would you do about molding a new Supreme Court vacancy for the Ninth Justice? 
he put it kind of concretely. And Hillary's answer was, she supports Roe versus Wade. 1973 decision. And, and, and Hillary is running as a woman. That's her main issue. I'm going to be the first woman president. And the Supreme Court decision giving women the right to choose abortion in consultation with the doctor's family and the clergy, if they're agreed, it was good for the health and of the mother. She just re-endorses that. And that's the reason why my wife was for Hillary even long before when I was still campaigning for Bernie Sanders. It was definitely a male-female confrontation here in this election. Anyway, it is not up to the government or the Southern Baptist Church or the Roman Catholics to force Protestants, Jews, atheists, agnostic women to give birth to unwanted babies. It is the right of each woman's conscious, religious, moral, and ethic values to decide when is a fetus becoming a viable baby. That's the big issue. Second issue. Hillary would appoint a justice who would overturn the oligarchic, plutocratic decision of the Roberts Court, which decided Citizens United versus the Federal Election Committee of 2010. The rights of persons are spelt out in the Bill of Rights, plus the 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment, and the 19th Amendment. A corporation, according to Hillary, and I agree 100% on this, is a legal entity that has been giving rights to personhood beyond a series, well, by, by, by a series of Republican court decisions expanding the conservative Supreme Court's decisions way back in 1886 gradually expanding the rights of corporations over individual rights, the Bill of Rights. Okay, I want to ask David right. about Citizens United. Um, I don't know what your knowledge of Citizens United is. <clears throat> it was a travesty, and it legalized political bribery in America in a very open way. And it's, I think... Uh, it was a long time coming. You've been hearing this argument made from conservatives for a while that somehow money equaled speech and by dint of that uh, corporations equal personhood. But I think that it's uh, baldly obvious to any actual human being that a corporation is not a fellow human being and that money does not necessarily equal speech. And while we all have the same voice and we all have the same ability to uh, participate in the agora of our political um, community. When a corporation has millions of dollars compared to a, an individual who only has maybe a couple hundred dollars, let's say at best, to spend on their political uh, participation, um, there's a great imbalance there and there's a great injustice. And so to equate the two things is nonsense. And that's pretty obvious to anybody who isn't a conservative jurist, it seems. Um, Citizens United is one of the worst decisions that I've ever seen in my lifetime handed down by the Supreme Court. And I hope it goes down in history as one of the worst decisions in the Supreme Court ever. Right. I think it deserves to. And I think that all it's done is um, solidify the oligarchy yeah. in America and the plutocracy in America. And it desperately needs to be overturned as soon as possible. Okay. Robert, um, perhaps this is uh, not with the debate, but this is a legitimate question sure, at this time. Sure, anything you question is but Can you de make the distinction between justice as we know it and social justice? Oh, yeah. I, it's my understanding from people that I know that social justice is not justice, in their opinion. I don't know if you agree with that or not. But. Well, uh, let's talk about the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution set up the uh, Judiciary uh, Committee. It set up the Supreme Court, and it said there are three branches of government. The President enforces the law. The law is made by Congress, and 
the Supreme Court has the duty to interpret conflicts of law. Okay? Now, the Supreme Court has expanded its powers by judicial decision, starting out with George Washington's administration, right up to the present day. Now, the corporate people don't like the expansion of uh, Supreme Court interpretations when it comes to taxes, but they're all in favor when it comes to corporate rights. Mm -hmm. So there's a hypocrisy there. Yeah. The, the, uh, the uh, justices then uh, have to interpret the law, and there is a progressive interpretation, and there is a kind of a conservative interpretation. And John Marshall was one of the chief conservative justices in the first 35 years of the court. <coughs> The next Supreme Court Justice was Justice Taney, and he made the disastrous decision that uh, Dred Scott was a piece of property and not a human being, mm -hmm. and that led to the Civil War, and when the Civil War was over, the amendments to the Constitution gave 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment gave black men citizenship in the United States, not to the states. So the states' powers have been cut down and the federal jurisdiction has been expanded, one of the chief decisions of the, of the Supreme Court. Right. The subdescendants could only get back into the federal union when they ratified the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendment. So they did that under wanting to come back to the union, because they lost the war. They'd rather have 22 southern senators than to have zero. So the Dred Scott decision brought that about. That was part of the origins of the Civil War, but it's not the only one. Right. They were the Douglas. Uh, I, find, I think that the history of the Supreme Court is kind of funny, especially in light of today's conservative arguments. So the first thing that they uh, argue against that you'll see a lot um, is just the idea of judicial review. And in, in general, they'll say that judicial review is somehow illegitimate when the court issues a decision that they don't like. But judicial review has been established since Marbury versus Madison. It's yeah. one of the central tenets right that now, our republic has existed on. AT and T. They want to buy Time Warner. Yeah, it has to go to the Supreme Court. Yeah. <laughs> and and then the other thing the other thing that I find funny is when they talk about activist judges. You hear this all the time: activist judges uh, inflicting baloney. their will. It is baloney because for much of the Supreme Court's history, in fact, for most of it, all the way up until maybe the Warren Court, you could argue it was conservative activist yeah. judges, such as the Fuller Robert, Court. I don't see your microphone. Oh, sorry. What happened? Such as the uh, Fuller Court. Oh, anyway, I speak loud enough to. The yeah. Well. It, it'll work. Hopefully you're catching <laughs> my microphone at least. Yeah. But the Fuller Court, uh, which struck down child labor laws yeah. and struck down uh, workers' rights, struck down uh, health and safety laws for minors and other workers. Now, that was a very conservativist, activist court. So I don't buy the nonsense about re judicial review or about judicial activism. They're just uh, a little bit bitter that the activism isn't going the corporate way anymore. Okay, to get back to Steve's original question, the uh, Supreme Court of the United States was talking about justice as a legal... The, justice was decided by lawyers, qualified lawyers. Now, social justice... Well, yeah, I just wanted to say, now, it's my understanding that justice is, uh, they decide justice by the Constitution. By judges. Yes, state the and judges local. And state, the Constitution. There are 50 states, there are 50 Supreme Courts, right. plus the federal courts. Right. And the appeals courts, the okay. Ninth Circuit. You've got to go through an appeal system. Yeah. So you're going to explain to me... Social. Social, okay. social justice is entirely different. Yeah. It comes from Karl Marx and socialism. Karl Marx said, well... The political rights in England, in the House of Commons and so forth, and the American Constitution, is all political. Economics is being underplayed here. So it was Karl Marx who invented the discipline called sociology. He was an economist, he was a historian, and he invented a new discipline called sociology. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you know, there's an informal government down below the formal structures of government, and that is social conflict. The working class, the uh, aristocratic class, Karl Marx outlined, as, as, and of course Madison knew this, but it was not spelt out. 
Madison knew there was a difference between the farming class and the merchant class and the British aristocracy. And the first thing the United States did was to abolish titles of nobility. You have to, you're all equal before, equal before the law. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, equal socially is what we're fighting about ever since Karl Marx came along. I just want to point out one more thing about Marx that maybe a lot of people don't know, but I'm sure you do, Professor. Uh, Marx's role in um, helping to convince European nations not to take a side against the North or in yes, favor of the true. South in the Civil War. Karl Marx was a basically a very uh, um, Radical, strong proponent oh. of social justice, and therefore he was an ally to Abraham Lincoln in Europe at the time of the Civil War. In fact, he was a correspondent for the New York Herald, a northern paper. Yeah. Right, wow. And was, was trying to convince the British government, forget about cotton right now, the important thing is free the slaves. Right. <laughs> so as long as we're on the subject of Karl Marx and social justice, I think his role in you know at least as a you know as an advocate during the civil war is important to mention right and then uh, from 1889 really from 1870 from 1870 but then it speeded up in 1889 socialist parties sprang up in europe and in 1884 the british labor party was organized it was labor unions plus the fabian socialists they wanted to go slow the uh, Russians were the most militant, the Russian Social Democratic Party. And Lenin became a revolutionary kind of socialism. So then there was a big argument among the socialists and the communists. How do you get socialism? Through the ballot box or through revolution? And that led eventually to the 1917 revolution. And uh, that was the big debate between communism and, uh, and socialism. Now, talking about the United States, Woodrow Wilson became a new kind of a liberal. He called it the new freedom. He says it's not just laissez-faire and justice between the capitalist and the working class. The working class should have the rights to have collective bargaining. Yeah. And the AFL was established in 1886. The mm -hmm. Railroad Brotherhood was established. So unions mm -hmm. had to be recognized by the American courts. And that's, of course, McGovern was in favor of social justice in, yeah. in our own times. Yeah. And that was at the time that there were these great fights being taken place where the Fuller Court was ruling against the unions most of the time, but you had people like Mother Jones right. and Eugene Debs and others um, right. out on the streets, you know, fighting these battles, being jailed for right. them, and, and literally bloodshed. You literally had the National Guard in several instances coming in right. and killing people. <laughs> on behalf of the... So uh, Hillary Clinton wants social justice for blacks, women, <laughs> recent immigrants. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, in general, over the last, you know, uh, 40 years or so, 40, well, since like the late 1960s, since the Civil Rights Bill and the great shift in parties, you've seen the Democrats uh, take up the mantle of social justice uh, much more vigilantly than the Republicans have. The Republicans have actually stood in the way of social justice in many cases, including recently. You know, we have recent examples such as in North Carolina with their bathroom law and uh, <laughs> their religious freedom laws that are basically a right to discriminate in public accommodation laws. But that public accommodation argument, we had that in the 60s. We had the lunch counter debates. We had the argument that there can't be discrimination in public accommodation and religion is not an excuse. Um, but anyway, we're getting a little off. Yeah. So. Well, actually, we're already into Wallace's second question. He said we were off the law, and, and kind of by accident. And Wallace's second issue was, of the two candidates, what would you do to improve the economy? And we've already been discussing this, that Hillary wanted well, to make some... Let's let David answer Okay, that let's first. get David on there. What, would, what, would, what was Hillary's answer and Trump's answer? <laughs> well, <was> an <laughs> Hillary, Hillary gave an answer that I like to think was inspired by her primary race against Bernie Sanders because she talked much more uh, about um, the problem with giving massive tax cuts to the rich at the expense of everyone else, more so than I've ever heard her really talk about that before. She pointed out that the tax cuts under uh, George W. Bush um, 
have been a a massive problem. I don't. I think that she missed an opportunity to to, to point out that they were, you know, for Republicans who like to to scream bloody murder about the dead all the time, the tax cuts under George W. Bush, and not to mention his wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, were some of the biggest major contributors to the growing national debt. So basically she, she presented the fairly standard progressive position that uh, Milton Friedman trickle down supply side economics has been a, uh, a harmful experience uh, to the American working class and the American middle class and that she wants to make people like Donald Trump pay more. Oh. Um, okay. That was Hillary's side. Okay. Yeah. You want to give... I, I would like to add to that, that Hillary's answer was that, and this is a little bit conservative in a way, that she would bring back industry to the United States, supporting uh, Jared Brown, <laughs> supporting uh, Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren, we have to expand the infrastructure, which had lagged since George W. Bush was president, and they spent the money on failed wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And the industrial production has also been failing in the United States because of export of private American corporations to China for cheap labor. So America's future economy will be uh, dependent on an increased production of, and this is Hillary's reform, solar and wind. This is going to be the future uh, expanding economy. Too bad for Virginia coal, uh, West Virginia coal, uh, they'll have to be, find new jobs. But the trickle down economy uh, and cutting taxes for the rich uh, does not stimulate uh, growth automatically. Okay, David, uh, you want to give the uh, Trump version of well, Trump did what he usually does on the economy, which is talk about cutting taxes. What he doesn't mention is that he's only planning on cutting taxes for himself and uh, not really anyone else as much. Uh, now, there are smaller tax cuts that go down as you go down the, the tax brackets, but the majority of the taxes that he wants to cut uh, go, again, toward the wealthy people like him. I don't know how he's going to cut his own taxes, considering he doesn't pay any, but... <laughs> Um, for people like him who are rich and actually do pay taxes, theoretically, under him, the taxes will be cut. But what, again, what I think needs to be noted about this, what's significant about it to anybody who cares about the debt, for instance, um, is that his plan will add $5 trillion to the debt. Now, Hillary repeatedly said during the debate that her plan doesn't add one penny to the debt. That's not true. It adds $200 billion. But there's an enormous difference between $5 trillion and $200 billion. Um, Trump's adds $5 trillion to the debt. Hillary's adds $200 billion. So uh, I think you can see there that while 200 billion is not a penny it's a lot better than five trillion under donald trump and what would donald trump's five trillion dollars in debt give us well you and me not much not much <laughs> of anything it would cut services it would cut health care it would cut uh food stamps for people for the most vulnerable it would hurt the most vulnerable among us what it would do is give a little bit of extra i don't know private jet money to billionaires right I would uh, add uh, to this trickle down, the false theory of economics has led to the Great Recession, 2007-209, uh, which uh, Trump blames on Obama, which is false. Okay, Robert, let me interject for a second here. Describe to the audience Milton Freeman's... Okay. Friedman's uh, economic plan right. and why you don't think it works. Okay. Milton Friedman was trying to counter John Maynard Keynes. You might say that John Maynard Keynes was a step towards socialism. His argument was you have to socialize the Federal Reserve Bank and you got to put a ceiling on the rich and you got to put a floor under the poor, uh, poor give social security, uh, teacher salaries and so forth, to make a prosperous economy, okay? Now, Milton Friedman said that Keynesism failed. 
And the reason why Keynesium did have a failure under Lyndon Johnson is that Keynes said, let's have a temporary debt in order to solve the unemployment problem. He did not say go into massive continual debt in order to fight foreign wars like the Indochina War. That kind of a debt is exactly right. like World War I and it leads to bankruptcy. Right. Nobody could pay the World War I debts back. Yeah. And that's where we get the huge national debt. So anyway, the trickle down uh, led to the Great Recession of 2009 and Milton Friedman is part, part of the problem because he didn't use, because the Federal Reserve Bank and the New Deal agencies like the, uh, the Security and Exchange Commission and the CCC and the NRA and all of those things were abandoned by the Republican presidents who didn't enforce them. And that's how w w the okay. debt went way, way, way up. We need to take a station break. Okay, fine. This is uh, Robert Whaley. I am a retired historian. I'm debating uh, the last uh, national debate with Mike Wallace and the Trump-Hillary debate. And my colleague is Dave DeWitt, a practicing journalist for the Ohio News. And uh, we have a slight difference of opinion, but we're about 99% on the same page as far as social justice is concerned, as far as Hillary and Trump are concerned. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> So, uh, okay, uh, well, well, Let's go I with the, go ahead. if I have something, well, I want to say something more about NAFTA. Trump blamed the loss mm. of jobs on NAFTA. Now, NAFTA is blamed on Hillary Clinton, as if Hillary Clinton had somehow or other drafted that. The reality of NAFTA is it was drafted by the Republican administration before Bill Clinton was elected. And Bill Clinton did not understand NAFTA, and he signed it. And that led to the idea of making Canada uh, and the United States and uh, uh, Mexico, Mexico all yeah. part of the common market. Yeah. Now, what NAFTA did in reality was to improve the income of the bankers in all three countries. I, I think you should point out, Robert, uh, that uh, NAFTA is the North American Free Trade Agreement for people who might not know. I'm glad Some you, of the I'm glad you younger that. audience. Oh, yeah, right. NAFTA is so forth and so on. It gave, it, the bankers win no matter what's traded. Yeah. The bankers make money on oil, on Mexican, uh, American right. food, but it hurts the farmers in Mexico. It gives the multinational corporations like uh, 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 you know, uh, right. the, well, who trade in grain internationally, yeah. they get profits. Yeah, so I just wanted to say, you know, he did come out and, and say that Bill Clinton's decision to uh, go with NAFTA was the worst decision that that he knew of. That's what that Bill, a president it, to make, and that Hillary at the time was just a housewife. She had nothing to do with that's that. That's right. So that is true. Yeah. So anyway, Sherrod Brown and Elizabeth Warren want to have fair trade, not free trade. Right. Milton Friedman was essentially Adam Smith, free trade. Mm -hmm. Free trade for the corporate power group, but not free trade for unions. <laughs> they need protection. <laughs> I would like to add something to the, the topic of NAFTA and, and Trump's ideas about trade in general. Um, the first thing, and I've said this before, is that he seems to indicate that the reason why companies are leaving the United States is because of overregulation or overtaxation, which is not true. They're leaving because of cheap labor, cheap labor in other countries. Right. Um, the other thing that's happening that's, that's driving down manufacturing jobs in America is the simple fact that you don't need as many laborers, as many physical people, to make the products or even you know, outproduce what was made in the past. Um, with the emerging technologies that we have. So what I'm saying there is essentially that we can make our productivity is going up and we're making more stuff, but we don't need to do it with the people that we did it be with before. We are doing it with less people. And so that's part of a transition that the United States and the world in general is going to have to make overall. We're going to have to approach the way manufacturing works and the way our labor force works in a different type of way because 
we can make more stuff with less people and that leads to less jobs and that's an, uh, and that kind of relates to the coal problem um, in West Virginia and Pennsylvania and eastern Ohio the coal communities uh, the fact of the matter is coal jobs are not coming back they're just not we're not going to see a re-emergence of coal uh, there's not a war on coal but war uh, but coal is as an industry going to continue to diminish and so what the Obama administration has been starting to do and what I would expect the Hillary administration would do is try to uh, transition with training, with uh, new opportunities in solar and wind, with emerging technologies to retrain this workforce to do something different. Coal's not coming back. Manufacturing jobs aren't coming back to America the way they existed before. So we're going to have to transition as a country into a whole new way of thinking, a whole new way of addressing our labor force, and a whole way, new way of paying our, our workers um, who work in growing industries like the service right. industry. Um, in summary, I, I would like to, or in conclusion, let us say, on this economic, neither candidate, neither party have adequately looked at the failures of the Federal Reserve Bank and the ever-increasing national debt. Everybody must buy and sell on fiat money, the dollar, the euro, the renminbi, and they're all stagnating, waiting for another crash to occur. And that is the problem of Janet Yellen. That is going to be Hillary's burden if she gets elected. <laughs> Continuing to artificial, artificially keep down interest rates is going to lead to a problem. It's going to lead to another bubble. And I wish that actually with the interest rates as low as they've been, I, I think that investors are making a mistake not investing more while these interest rates stay low because they can't stay at essentially zero, which they are now, forever. Um, I think that all started with Alan Greenspan and Larry <clears throat> Summers and some of those people uh, back there. I wanted to say something, if I could, as a moderator about Good. NAFTA. I, I know a little bit about NAFTA. Good. Um, it didn't, and, and, and I don't think you really should, uh, I don't really care for Bill Clinton, but I don't think you should blame him for signing that uh, package because it sounded good at the time. And there, but it did not work as it was designed. Right. Uh, but it, some good things did come out of that. Uh, I was involved in the trucking industry for years, and what we saw there is Mexican trucks can bring up Mexican goods to the U inside the U.S. border. They drop those trailers. American trucks or Canadian trucks can hook onto those uh, trailers and the American, the U.S. trucks can de deliver those in the United States. The Canadian trucks have to take those back to Canada. Now the Canadian trucks can come to the U.S. and deliver goods, but they have to pick up goods either from Mexico or the United States and go back to Canada with them. Uh, they, can't, they can't pick up goods here and deliver. Right. For instance, they can't pick up goods in Boston and deliver in San Francisco. They can't do that. The Texans have a very good union. <laughs> but the whole thing about it is it has enabled uh, the distribution of goods. It has improved a great deal over the years. So that's why you're able to get things the next day. You order something one day and you get it the next day, thanks to uh, NAFTA. You know, uh, whether it comes from Mexico or whether it comes from right. Canada. But the know. key question that's left out is who gets the profits? Well, <laughs> yes, I, I have no idea <laughs> who does that. But. The small trucking company like my father is out of business. Yeah. You have to have a U.S. Express. Right. So U.S. Express, and of course you got a, you had to have a speed up. You had to make money by driving eight hours, nine hours a day, or you wouldn't get any money. Right. So it's, it's uh, being taken out of the hide of the uh, drivers. Mm -hmm. Safety. Yeah, well, the larger <laughs> companies always are going to probably realize the most profit That's versus right. the, the smaller. But you have owner-operators. What they do is they lease on to these bigger companies, so right. they get a piece of the pie there. They get a piece of the pie. Yeah. But anyway, that's the ICC regulations. <laughs> okay, well, the other thing that the debate there, uh, what uh, we want to go to another question. Half of it, so.
Do we want to go to a third issue? Yeah, let's do that. Third uh, issue of Wallace was how do you, the two candidates, handle the Isis problem and the new offensive led by the Iraq government with U.S. air support against Mosul? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's have David go with that. Well, again, um, Donald Trump um, displayed his utter lack of understanding or knowledge or even interest in the actual situation of what's going on. I believe that the only thing that he was able to regurgitate was uh, Mosul's a disaster. Um, and and that's one of his favorite words. He uses it to describe almost everything. Especially, it's one of the keys. You can tell he doesn't know what he's talking about when he just calls it a disaster and doesn't really <laughs> well, have anything else greatest. to say about it. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> the Mosul offensive is a is an extremely interesting offensive, actually, and it may vindicate the Obama strategy in Syria and Iraq, or it may be uh, his utter downfall. But so far, it is not a disaster. It's been it's liberated over seventy villages. I think they've uh, did the Kurd led by the Kurds and the Iraqi army with support and in, intelligence from American military officials. They've taken over three hundred square miles um, in the area, uh, and that's only in the first week or so of the campaign. Uh, a campaign that's expected to last months. They've bombed hundreds of targets in ISIS, and uh, they've severely disrupted the ISIS stronghold in Mosul. So for uh, Trump to call it a disaster just shows me that he has no idea what he's talking about. And once again, he's rejecting the not only the advice, but the uh, stated positions and facts represented by America's generals. He doesn't seem to have any respect for America's generals or intelligence community, um, or at least not insofar as that he can't help himself but ignore them entirely. Hillary has a better understanding of what's actually happening, but I don't know that she has any good solutions um, yeah. beyond hoping that this Mosul offensive works. Yeah, I am a little bit more pessimistic than Dave is. Uh, the Syrian civil war is limited and it's complex and it is being intervened and manipulated by the United States, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Iran, and Turkey. Now those powers all have their own interests. The Shia and the Sunnis and the Iranians and the Kurds have different national and religious interests from the Alawite regime in Syria. So, the United States Secretary of State, John Kerry, is stalling. He's able to negotiate with Russian foreign minister and the Russian ambassador over the control of the port of Aleppo. Yeah. They have a truce, a ceasefire, it lasts for a week, and then they have combat. So a series of ceasefires, which are broken in the following week, is not a solution. Now, Obama is losing his cool, in a sense, because he's saying, I'm going to go all out, and I could win this, and I'll come out as a hero, or it could backfire. If he takes Mosul, and there's a huge number of deaths there, and the Turks intervene, and they start fighting against the... The Kurds, <laughs> which they've done who, before. Who knows? Then it's going to go against Trump, I mean, uh, uh, Obama, and then he can say, well, Hillary, it's your problem. <laughs> That's going to be Hillary's problem. How do you pick up the piece? Because we failed in Indochina. We failed in Syria and Iraq, Afghanistan, under George W. Bush. He is the so-called elephant in the living room. They don't want to talk about that disastrous war that went from 2000 to 2008 with no resolution. Well, yeah. And Donald <laughs> Trump spent the debate trying to blame the rise of Daesh, ISIL, ISIS, on Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. But obviously, if the region weren't vastly destabilized by George Bush's um, terrible wars in the first place, this opportunity for ISIL, ISIS, Daesh, whatever you want to call them, to rise wouldn't have been there. I, I think what uh, his uh, argument was that the fact that when uh, Obama pulled those troops out of Iraq, 
Right. It, it, it led to the uh, formation of ISIS. Right. And what he doesn't mention when he makes that point is that what Obama did was follow the agreement that was already negotiated by the George W. Bush administration. Now, you could make the argument that the Obama administration should have renegotiated that or called it off and developed their own plan. But the fact of the matter is that Obama opposed the Iraq war in the first place. And he ran in 2008 on the promise to get uh, America, American troops out of that war. And by and large, he's done that. We've gone from, what, over 160,000 troops in Iraq and Afghanistan to less than 20,000, yeah, you know, so. something like that. Unfortunately, under the Obama administration, we are still currently bombing six different countries. So he's not the uh, dove that and some of us were hoping for. In any for. case, I agree with Dave that uh, as Secretary of State, and they addressed Hillary as the Secretary of State, and Trump is only Mr. Trump, real estate dealer. The <laughs> Secretary of State does have more knowledge of how to deal with the State Department bureaucracy and the uh, Defense Department, and she'll do a better job than Trump will ever do, but she is still likely to drift into war, and she's made a mistake over Libya, and so I'm a little bit pessimistic about uh, Hillary's uh, future as a one-term president. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't, I, I don't like the fact that she is a fairly standard neoliberal foreign policy hawk. And I think that it's going to take an enormous amount of pressure from those of us on the left to get her to uh, resist the temptations that neoliberal hawkishness might give her as far as American interventionalism around the globe. So the people on the left are going to continue to have to keep the pressure up on Hillary as far as uh, foreign engagement. So are we ready for the fourth issue? Yes. The fourth issue, both candidates, how do you each explain your policies toward Russia's Vladimir Putin? What did they say? <laughs> David, start with that. Well, once again, uh, in this part of the debate, Donald Trump disrespected, disavowed, and dismissed the American intelligence community by denying what they're telling us about Russia's interference with the American election. Now, Russia's interfering on their behalf because, uh, obviously, Vladimir Putin um, favors Trump for reasons of his own in this election. But for again, for Trump to just outright dismiss the intelligence reports that he himself has been receiving from the American intelligence community is baffling to me as a presidential candidate. I don't know who he thinks he's scoring points with, but it's a tough argument to make that you should be commander in chief when uh, you're willing to dismiss the advice, the facts, the evidence presented by your own military and intelligence community. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Hillary implied uh, that Trump is admired by Putin. That might be an exaggerated statement. And the other dictators in the Russian sphere of influence and the greater Middle East. Trump, with his usually overblown rhetoric, blamed Hillary for 30 years of inactivity. And when he gets in there as the great leader, he said, I am at least willing to talk to Putin, looking for a deal. I can make a deal with Putin. That's why Putin likes <laughs> Trump better than Hillary, because Putin knows that Hillary has the backing of the military-industrial complex in the United States. Right. Now, Trump is implying, well, maybe he can uh, make a deal at the expense of, what, Netanyahu? <laughs> Israel? <laughs> That's going to blow up in somebody's face. <laughs> well, I, I also, I, I think he claims to be a friend of uh, Netanyahu. Trump does. I don't know so. how that fits with He with does. Putin. And yeah, as, yeah, it doesn't there's it doesn't an extreme make cognitive dissonance going on there. Yeah. If he thinks that he can play buddies with both Bibi and Vladimir and <laughs> I maybe he just believes so much in the force of his personality and that doesn't surprise me either considering his 
insanely obvious megalomania, but it doesn't make any sense with regard to the balance of power that we often discuss and actually right. playing the pl chess game of world, you know, geopolitics. And Israel, he says, I have investments in Israel. <laughs> I mean, where does I'm that a friend of Israel? <laughs> where does that put him with regard to the Assad regime in Syria or the Iranian uh, uh, theocrats, you know, or um, Israel, the two states? It, think, it's I incoherent. His I, positions are I don't incoherent. Think any foreign country admires Trump. Can you? Think no, that? no, I <laughs> admires him. I don't think that they admire him at all. I think Vladimir Putin sees a political, a geopolitical Possib opportunity. Possibly he can disrupt. He can disrupt the possible Syrian, no, the possible Ukrainian-Russian problem. There's where the Democrats are weak. Bill Clinton and uh, neocons have been playing politics in the Ukraine. And that's where Putin and uh, uh, Trump might do a deal. What do you do about the Ukraine? Do you, do, you, do you sell out the Ukraine or do you sell out big oil? That's, that's where the so-called deal is theoretically possible. <laughs> so my suggestion is, if you want a, my own solution, uh, the American government has to restore the principles of the balance of power of John Quincy Adams and Henry Kissinger. In order to do that, you have to make a deal with the Russian government to sign an agreement, a military agreement in which the United States and Russia together intervene in Syria in order to end the Syrian war. So the concessions the United States must make if they're going to get a Russian agreement, are you going to give Russia an agreement on oil prices? You can't win monopoly by trying to get every, every property on the board. That's not the balance of power. That's an absurdity. The clear policy of the State Department must be to leave Russia and the Ukraine to make their own regional agreements. That could be a th thing that, we, that the United States could give to Russia. And that would possibly bring the war. The unfortunate facts are that since Bill Clinton came to power in 1992, all of the presidents have lost the understanding of balance of power principles. Henry Kissinger retired. But John Quincy Adams and uh, Hillary Clinton knows you have to deal with both sides. Now, Churchill and Roosevelt and Stalin, the big three, used the balance of power principles to defeat Germany, Japan, and Italy in the Second World War. Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon lost it. Henry Kissinger discovered it for a short period of time to get Nixon out of the Vietnam War and get Israel out of Egypt. He had two balance of power agreements, but they were of short duration. And when he retired, Henry Kissinger goes and becomes Kissinger's associates and is giving anybody advice if they pay him cash. So I don't know what, well, of course he's, what, 100 years old now? How old is he? No, uh, he's yeah, definitely somewhere in his He was 90s. born in 1923. <laughs> <laughs> so he's out, of, he's out of the game. But you can still read the biography of Henry Kissinger, of how he did it, yes. and how another... And while you're at it, you should read Christopher Hitchens' The Trial of Henry Kissinger. Well, that's the other side of the story. Right. Henry, Henry Kissinger was... Some balance. Yeah, well, he was a... Uh, the balance of power people are not Democrats. <laughs> Before we get into anything else, Robert, I wanted to <clears throat> ask about, you know, um, Assad there and in Aleppo, uh, Syria, um, they haven't been able to remove him. I know, um, you know, it, doesn't Putin want to keep uh, Assad in place? And yes. I don't know what the United States has. Well, Kerry, I think, and, and, and the administration made a mistake. Originally, they were going to overthrow Assad. They thought that's easy. 
That, and that Netanyahu probably yeah. told him, let's get rid of Assad. He's the problem. They underestimated <laughs> Iran and Russia's commitment to keeping Assad in power. And they underestimate the fact that the Syrian people are not going to become servants of Israel. Yeah. Right. <laughs> And that there is, there is no well-structured, well-organized uh, democratic group in Syria to take over. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, the audience might get tired of me pointing this out, but it re always remains true of the Middle East when there is a power vacuum. Usually it is the theocrats, the religious extremists that are organized enough to assume power once the region is destabilized. Okay, uh, we've got about... Four minutes left in the program. So well, maybe we ought to get to the last uh, question. Let's go ahead and, and if you want to have another question or do you want to do a summary? Or oh, no. We, that, we don't have much time left. The, the last question is the key question. Okay, well, let's what go was, with it. What then. was, what was uh, Trump's immigration? Thing? No, the sixth issue was oh. uh, Chris Wallace. Six. Blew Trump's campaign out of the water. The last question to both oh. Hillary and Donald Trump. Would you accept your opposition's right to the presidency in the event of your defeat in the polls on November 8th? Right. What did the pundits think of that? <laughs> and what did Trump say? <laughs> okay, David, do you want to go with that? <laughs> well, Trump basically said that he'll make the decision, he'll keep us in suspense and make the decision at the time. Um, and he's been continuing on the campaign trail to peddle this rhetoric that the election is rigged and that everyone's against him and that the, every, his, his people should go to the polls and make sure that there's no funny business. And I, what it means essentially is that he's likely to take the unprecedented step of not conceding the election to his opponent after it's over. Uh, Hillary's best hope for... Um, Combating that is to annihilate him on November what do you, what 8th. What do you mean by annihilate? I mean, win, get, get more votes. win so yeah. huge that yeah. there is no argument that he could possibly make to any reasonable person. I mean, surpassing B Barack Obama's 335 in the college in 2012. I'm talking well, the 365, <laughs> as, win as many states as possible, win places story. like Nevada, win North Carolina, win right. Georgia, win so big that he has no argument. That's the best thing she can do. She's playing right. around with Texas. Okay, Robert. <laughs> Well, I guess uh, 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 I don't have anything to add to that, uh, blowing it out of the water. Uh, and uh, I think we're ready to summarize the whole thing. Uh, we won't have time to get into the Mexican immigration law, but that is going to be, a, that was the major strength of Hillary next, uh, the major strength of Trump and the major problem of, of Hillary if she does get office, what is she going to do about a comprehensive immigration policy? That is for the future. And I guess we'll end it right there. Uh, and we'll say that we have a minute to describe yeah. our you own each have summary. A minute. Yeah, yeah. You want to say something yeah, about that? Yeah, so in, in summary, I guess for my minute, with, on the issues that we've covered, the Supreme Court, uh, Roe versus Wade, American foreign policy, um, what would the candidates do to improve the economy on all these issues over and over again? Donald Trump displayed that he has no idea what he's talking about. He's not prepared to be president. He's not even prepared to be a candidate. David, I hate to cut in, but uh, give Robert 30 seconds. And all right. Well, I think that the last comment is, in this election, the, quote, rig system implies that the entire American constitutional government has failed. And it implies that Donald Trump may think he could have some kind of a quasi-fascist kind of coup d'etat looking for General Franco or Benito Mussolini. Is there some kind of a hidden military man in the Pentagon? Okay, that's it. That's the secret that's end. It. That's it. And thank you for coming. Thanks, Professor. This is called debate. This is called debate is the auction of democracy. And we'll have to think about what we're going to do on November 1st. Till next time. <laughs>